Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, the research that I'm going to share with you is a remote parental guidance in occupational therapy for children with learning disabilities, which I've got the opportunity to work with an occupational therapist in Mauritius, Mrs. Uh, Simi Sigulam. It's just my, uh, my presentation is not working. Okay, so um, the Mauritian government bodies, NGOs and private sectors have created much awareness for uh, SAN, which they call special education needs for children with learning disabilities. And that was in alignment of the SAN policy with the SDG4 to ensure in inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities by leaving no children behind. And its strategic goal is to fo is focus on advocacy, partnership, and empowerment where peers, teachers, parents, and professionals are involved for a right-based advocacy, shared responsibility, and removal of attitudinal barriers. So uh, some of the concepts that we want to, sh to, to clear, it's about learning disability, which is um, a disorder in one of or more of the basic psychological processes related to understanding using language, uh, be it spoken or written, um, or manifesting as an imperfect ability to listen, think, speak, read, write, spell, or to do mathematical calculation. And with regard to occupational therapy, it's a client-based health profession aimed at the promotion of health and well-being through occupational uh, through an occupational therapist uh, to enable people to participate in activities. And these people, they 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 try to help uh, the patient who they refer to as clients to be able to do their daily activities. And it's also important to, to observe that knowledge transfer in occupational therapies focuses on exploiting existing resources and exploring the possibilities to make activities more efficient and effective. So, uh, uh, literature confirms that family-centered practice in um, Pediatric uh, OT involves participation of parents, families, and the OT, and acknowledging to understand the children best, or uh, their children best, and also family forms part of the intervention. And family-centered intervention in a rehabilitation setting until the active engagement of many families and also family-centered care influence parental role in the child's care based on true collaboration as well as each family preferences for collaboration is unique and the child behavior problems require uh, the parents ideas about treatment participation. So uh, it's also important to observe that uh, there are many e-tools of adoption for uh, uh, patients like telehealth program together with instructional video or animation, email, teleconferencing, as well as uh, which has been implemented across health-related discipline, disorder, evidence-based treatment approaches. Our research aim was to determine the possibility of having uh, intervention occupational therapy sessions, which we refer to IOTS, with children with learning disabilities during the second lockdown period of the COVID-19 pandemic in Mauritius, that was in March 2021. And our objectives were to assess parents during the remote IOTS for children with learning disabilities, provide basic remote occupational therapy to parents, as well as to propose recommendation to improve uh, remote ideas to these children. And that research was purely on a, um, um, on a qualitative uh, basis as an experiential uh, research to allow to capture insight through remote observations and the sample size, uh, the occupational therapist had uh, uh, a size, a batch of 12 uh, children. So the whole, uh, the whole batch was used under observation 
and um, there are also 12 mothers and six fathers. And the facilitator was uh, Mrs. Sonatin. And the criteria that we took into consideration were children aged from uh, three years to 10 years, children having a learning disability, um, as well as um, children who were already following face-to-face uh, occupational therapy session six months minimum before the pandemic and the frequency of of uh, guidance online were on average two uh, uh, two times weekly during the IOTS and this was through uh, using whatsapp and each comprised of 45 minutes to one hour so strategies were that we used to meet the research objectives were firstly, we developed a first strategy, which was notification, WhatsApp notification sent to parents for um, IOTS. And that was, uh, we observed only the mothers, the 12 mothers responded, not the fathers. And then uh, the second strategy, after the first strategy, we, we decided to, to integrate the fathers. So it was a notification, WhatsApp notification sent to fathers. Strategy three was notification sent to both parents for OT uh, sessions after strategy two. Then after strategy three was implement implemented, we had a combination of face-to-face -face and uh, WhatsApp sessions. And finally, uh, the OT had uh, got opportunity to evaluate the child progress under mentorship of the parents. So activities and materials were prepared as an OT kit Email, which was emailed to parents for their remote IOTS. And once these objectives attained, the activities were upgraded by the therapist considering the availability of the materials that they, they had at home. And um, these are the findings I've presented as a dashboard. So I want to highlight things which are, I mean, important in information that we have gathered. So six, out of 12 mothers were digital literate and six out of the 12 fathers positively contributed to IOTs, which shows that only six fathers uh, participated in this uh, in these sessions. And um, <coughs> they, are, they had, uh, with regard to their emotional quotient, the occupational therapist had to implement some de-rolling sessions conducted for seven parents who were very stressed and strained because they were working and they also had to look after the household. Commitment are six out of 12 fathers were, were uh, ready to participate in the IOTS as mentioned and that was after the four sessions. Uh, conducted. During remote IOTS, parents were more involved and this is where they could acquire more knowledge. The contribution also, uh, we have seen that parents could understand their children's abilities better and the purpose behind objective settings and fulfillment. With regard to skills development, all parents needed training and guidance to help handle their children for goal formulation and improve their basic OT and other skills. And with regard to personality trait, it was interesting to find that uh, parents were, were uh, uh, declared that they, they could build on the patient's confidence, motivation, and in, they could encourage uh, 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 each other uh, for their children with learning uh, disabilities. With regard to the Yeah. With regard to occupational therapy uh, information, uh, the, the, our therapists had uh, six years of hands-on practice with patients with uh, disabilities, including children, and her intervention was aligned with the National Syllabus of Education and Learning Milestone. The, she ensured most appropriate knowledge was transferred to the 12 mothers and six fathers, and the, she could explain the no what and the why behind each activity she sent for the, these children. The basic OT skills taught to these parents were uh, related to activities of daily living, 
to ensure their children with learning disabilities become autonomous, improve their language and also speech, and as well as feedback help parents to build on their patients. Uh, children with learning disabilities, they were, uh, the OT made emphasis on all the free occupational performance like self-care, productivity and play, as well as leisure. And these activities were, uh, were objective set and some were designed for the children by the OT while other activities were left to the parents. And uh, the motivated parents support their children's self-improvement at a quicker uh, pace. Other support system that we uh, discovered is that uh, the home environment of the 12 uh, families had to be modified accordingly to the needs during the remote IOTS. Some other cheap available materials from kitchen household tools, relevant uh, YouTube were used to support uh, the students as well as close relatives form part of the support system. This is something that we have developed based on the findings that the holistic approach of the OT system uh, encompass academic, phys physical, emotional, social, psychological, artistic and creative dimensions, as well as uh, home modification and uh, different interventions such as face-to-face -face and online. Uh, to conclude, uh, we observed that 12 mothers and the six fathers benefited from the training guidance provided by the therapist. Studies supported parents in identifying uh, difficulties that their children had with regard to activities of daily living, and um, as well as the use of WhatsApp was a telecom teleconferencing medium, as mentioned by uh, these authors. And we also found that the personality traits and feedback mechanism form part of the initial guidance strategy for parents. As a um, recommendation, we recommend firstly that the, train, the majority of the parents need, need uh, training for basic digital literacy skills and tools. We also propose an e-intervention occupational therapy support, EIOTS, to give positive results. Uh, to improve, to better uh, uh, contribute to knowledge transfer experiences and techniques. E-assessment strategy for parents by OT in evaluating the parental progress in their OT mission time with their children, as well as engaging fathers in IOTs. And the future work that we intend to do is towards creative ideas by parents to be approved by the therapist, to be shared as a collaborative activity among parents. The IOT is to include a COP of occupational therapists at national and inter international levels as guest speakers for knowledge sharing, as well as a, a, a performance areas of pediatric uh, occupational therapy to train parents on advanced uh, skills related to uh, specific objectives. And uh, this is um, our own compilation with regard to what we have explored. So it's more with regard to remote knowledge and skills transfer, where you have different components like the current knowledge and skills transfer, as well as our proposed knowledge skills transfer mechanism with regard to prerequisite digital uh, literacy skills, which will really help us towards the EIOTS. And that will be where the parents will be able to develop, uh, to, to build on their knowledge, to develop their skills, as well as their personality traits. So as an end note, uh, our mission is to bring smile to children with learning disabilities, parents and society aiming towards an economies productive human capital. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. My name is Chinedo Kongwa. I'm here to present uh, on, about on evaluating the ethical implications of using charcoal system in a uh, higher education. The outline of this presentation will cover the introduction, the design methodology, the research methodology, provides for analysis, result, and conclusion. And introduction. One of the artificial intelligence 
power technology that has been potential of supporting education is that system or conventional system. A chatbot system is a computer program that stimulates interactions with users through natural language. It is an intelligent system that can communicate with the students in form of questions and answers to provide correct uh, responses to their questions and promote their interactive learning. Chatbot system is being used virtually in every aspect but in education is used by students, used by teachers, administrators to perform different duties, and its benefit is enormous. The application of the chatbot system in education has revolutionized or is revolutionizing educational system. Chatbot system makes learning more engaging, interactive, and well improving and as well improving students' student, uh, learning capabilities. Because it allows students to learn at their own comfort. It allows students to make use of their mobile devices to explore the module contents or other uh, learning uh, materials they need at the uncomfort of their home or comfort of their at their, at their own pace. The application of charitable system in education assists teachers in lowering their workload with daily duties and assessing students' assignments, performance, even help them in content development. To administrators in the higher education, it helps them collecting data, evaluating students, uh, course schedules, providing answers to frequent asked questions. Chatbot has been proven to have a significant in impact in the education system, especially during this time of COVID-19, where learning is digital or online. With the assistance of chatbot, learning contents are deployed online. And with the help of their mobile phone, they can sit at their own comfort and explore the content. There are different kinds of chatbots. The one that can help students generate past questions which they can practice at their own pace. In as much as past chatbot has been coached in the educational sector, it poses some uh, ethical issues. Because the technology that interacts with humans is a machine interacting with humans, it poses some ethical issues. Some of these ethical issues has to do with users' privacy, users' uh, trust and transparency, mm -hmm. the design of the chatbot itself, and even uh, uh, some extent of digital divides. As a result of this, several studies have mentioned or highlighted that chatbot has some ethical challenges. The use of chatbot in education has some ethical challenges. The one thing clear is that none of them has empirical investigate the impact of these challenges. They just highlighted it. So in this study, we examine or investigate the implication of the use of such chatbot system in education in order to determine the practical significance or practical impact on the users. Then to address this issue, see, then the research question is, how does the user's ethics influence the use of chatbot in education. Uh, 
to address this issue, we conducted uh, empirical research using quantitative method through survey, using questionnaires, data collection, and our target audience are faculties and students. Those that are involved in educational activities. Then we conducted an online survey. Like I said, our main target was the student and faculty in higher education. We used, uh, we used samples from the University of Johannesburg and some higher educations like uh, Pearson College and others. At the end of the questionnaire, we received about 315 uh, responses. Our responses comprises of male and female, male 60%, female 40%. And the students, about 50% of students, 40% of faculty and others. Then the age range was between 15 years and 65. The majority of the participants fall within 15 and 35 years, which gives us the expected response because it seems that the student participated and the next uh, group were the, what we are going to be the uh, faculty, which is within 36 and 35 uh, years. You see, in the results, we observe that most of the participants acknowledge that they know or you have used chatbot system. And then regarding the ethical challenges, the ethical challenges, they agree that those are the right ethical challenges of the privacy, trust and the transparency and the digital divide and others, that they are posing some concerns. Then we do the reliability analysis on the construct and we find all the constructs to be reliable, which means that the questionnaire is potential enough of getting us the information we need. Then following the results, we get more relational analysis. Why? Because we want to determine the significant impact of the, those ethical challenges. Then, having known from our statistical analysis that privacy, transparency, and trust, system personality, design method, and digital divide has some level of positive impact on the users of chatbot system. Then, from multi-integration uh, analysis, we discover that privacy, transparency and trust, and digital drive has a practical significant impact on the user's chatbot system in education. So back to our research question, you see, it is now empirical to provide that the use of chatbot system has some impact um, or privacy, transparency and trust, all this can influence the adoption and use of chatbot system in uh, higher education. So, to improve the use of chatbot system in higher education, the area of privacy, like when interacting with your chatbot system, Users have to give us some data from private server. For instance, the chatbot system, the health system will require that you give uh, provide some of your health information, which is personal and a private information for the user. So now it is not required to the either the stakeholders to ensure that users understand how these information are being stored. You have two minutes, two minutes left, two minute warning. Okay, how these are being used? Same thing that will improve their transparency and, and, and trust on using the system. 
and also the FGD, right? Just to ensure that something like connectivity is widespread, that every individual has that decent equal access to make use of the type of system. Then in conclusion, like I say, we evaluated the ethical implication of use of charitable system in higher education. A quantitative research approach was applied through the through a survey. It was discovered that certain ethical issues in some areas such as privacy, trans, trends and trust, system personality, design method, and digital divide has some influence in the use of charitable system in education. Then further analysis found that the privacy, transparency and trust and digital divide has a practical significant impact on the use of charitable system in education. Thank you. Okay, okay. Well, um, uh, welcome everybody and thank you. Um, uh, uh, I really hope that we're going to keep you all awake. So, uh, um, my name is Brian Swartz and my colleagues Rita Patnik and we're from CPUT in the Western Cape in South Africa. Could you uh, change the, the, to the next slide, please? So this, um, so I'm going to go and speak. And so this is a, actually a follow-up study to a study we did last year using mobile instant messaging to teach. And the study that we did last year, which was published in the Proceedings of Digital, um, we looked at, we focused at something called utility and usability of MIMS apps. So utility refers to the pedagogical and the social advantages of MIMS apps and usability refers to how easy it is to use MIMS apps. And our study was predominantly, we had predominantly positive results. So um, we, we, we uh, the findings were that MIMS is suitable to use um, to teach your students in a situation such as where COVID um, came along and we couldn't have face-to-face -face teaching um, and webinars became um, quite expensive. So in studying MIMS apps, we, the students also reported that barriers such as connectivity, load shedding and data depletion was, was an issue for them um, learning during COVID and therefore MIMS apps really presented a superior solution to overcome those challenges. We then thought, these are interesting findings, we need to continue this research. So then we wondered how socially just it would be to, um, to continue using MIMS, MIMS apps for teaching and learning purposes. And at this point, I must just point out that we used two apps. We used a Telegram app and we used a WhatsApp app. And so Telegram we used for part-time students, um, final year part-time students, and, and WhatsApp we used for second year students. And the reason behind, well, the, using the two apps, we weren't trying to compare them. We were literally just trying to do an exploratory study. To, to look at social justice, we decided to use a framework that was um, proposed by Nancy Fraser called the three R's, which is redistribution, recognition and representation. And Nancy Fraser basically said that in a classroom space without redistribution, recognition and representation, it would not be socially just. If you can go to the next slide um, and I'll quickly explain what, what these what these concepts are. So redistribution um, basically is, Nancy suggests, it's when economic structures impede certain members of a community from participating fully. So in our classroom environment, if there are certain structures, economic structures is not having devices um, to continue um, engaging in teaching and learning, that would be impeding, impeding. And so members of that community, so it is, would, would be the, the classroom, the students in the classroom would be inhibited from fully participating and they, as they don't have the resources to interact with peers or with the educator. And so they suffer from distributive injustice or maldistribution. And in this case, redistribution is the corrective action that we should take. The, the next concept that Nancy's second art is recognition. So recognition refers to when institutional hierarchies of cultural values prohibit members of the community, so people in the classroom, from participating in terms of parity. So on an equal footing, they're pre prohibited um, for, from participating with either the educator 
or with other members in the classroom. And so we ask the, the question in our research is, how does using a mobile instant messaging app promote recognition and thereby, uh, or, or could it possibly hinder recognition and thereby um, promote social justice in our classroom? The final R is representation. And here Nancy explains that when decision rules inhibit a community, uh, members of a community from participating as equal partners in social interaction, it denies them an equal voice in the discussions, in the community discussions and in democratic decision making. So if you can move on to the next slide, please. In this context, um, representation um, entails recognizing who is allowed to act who's allowed to provide opinions or challenge in our academic environment. And it's particularly, this became particularly significant in, in lockdown, especially at the start of lockdown, when student voices became critical. For us to continue, we needed to know what the students' needs were, and we needed to dialogue with our students. And by doing this, we could ensure that representation is ensured. And now we are allowed to, and, and from this perspective, we, we perform this study, this follow-up study to our pilot study to find out, does MIMS promote these three R's? Recognition, redistribution, recognition, and um, representation. So the, in our follow-up study, we had a mixed method research instrument. So it was an embedded instrument. It was a questionnaire, but there were open-ended questions in, in there. So we collected both qualitative and quantitative data. Our sample size, um, despite, I think we had something like 250 students, potential research participants. We extended an invitation to all of them to, to fill in our questionnaire, but only 69 of them actually um, uh, uh, responded. There were 19 liquid scale questions and five open end questions. And then we did uh, dis both descriptive statistics and thematic, um, uh, thematic qualitative um, data analysis on the open ended on the open-ended questions data. Um, and so let's speak a little bit about our findings. Um, the general opinion um, is that MIMS, and this is overwhelming, using a MIMS app is easy access, it's instant access, the students enjoyed the quick response, and this was a recurring theme. However, specifically, if we drill down specifically on the topics of redistribution, recognition, and representation, Shweta, you can go to the next slide. We, in terms of, um, in terms of redistribution, actually, uh, promoting parity, equal, equal footing amongst the students in, the, in, in terms of teaching and learning. The students reported to us that, um, that they preferred, they actually preferred using um, MIMS apps to face-to-face -to -face and webinars. In terms of face-to-face, 51% -face, of those students that use Telegram um, said that they preferred it over face-to-face -face classes. And 40% uh, of those who use WhatsApp said they preferred it over uh, WhatsApp face-to-face um, -face classes. In terms of webinars, and, and we see these, uh, they, 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 they prefer face, they prefer webinars to face-to-face -face more. They prefer, in terms of webinars, there's a drop in that percentage because webinars are similar to, um, webinars are similar to uh, MIMS using MIMS app, except MIMS using a MIMS app is an asynchronous way to communicate with students and using a webinar is a synchronous way. So only 38% of our research participants felt it was easier to learn their content um, on MIMS as opposed to using webinars, which is online class meeting, and 34% felt that way uh, about WhatsApp. Um, and the, we'll, we'll elaborate. What we ultimately what what we ultimately do, deduce from that is that MIMS will never actually replace webinars or face to face teaching. It should just be used as a supplement. And we'll tell you a little bit about the advantages and the disadvantages. Uh, Sweta, could you go to the next slide? So this is the reason why it should only be 
used um, as a supplement. The disadvantages that students reported is there's high chances of being distracted. So many messages at once were very overwhelming. From These are some of the open-ended responses that we got. Poor network connectivity, some documents get lost because phones don't have space and phones break so you're unable to attend um, lessons and there's a possibility that you might lose all your information and a cell phone is unpredictable. So these are the, dis the, the, the disadvantages and we find that it's an overlapping, the students in the open-ended responses, we also found that the students didn't enjoy the overlapping between what is their, their pedagogical space, what is their education space and what is their social space. So there were blurred lines there that students did not enjoy. But there were, at the same time, there are some advantages, which is on the next slide. Um, in the quote above, in the quotes above, these are the positives which enabled redistribution and equal parity in the classes. The MIMS app uses less data, which we actually reported on in our previous study last year. The lessons are available for you in your own time and you can access and listen to it. It's easy to access. If anyway, you get to see other students questions which can assist you and you can access it anywhere and it's convenient. And this one student said she sat um, with her work, with her schoolwork or her varsity work during hospital visitors with her now late grandfather and that helped her a lot in particular. Thank you. So to the next slide, Sweta. So moving on to recognition and representation. So here during the data analysis of the questionnaire, we found that the, the recognition and uh, representation um, dimensions were blurred. There's overlapping areas. So from our point of view, just quickly going back to what we understood recognition to be, it is taking action to prevent our students from feeling unnecessarily vulnerable or discriminated against due to their personal situation. Simultaneously, representation means adopting measures. So it's actually being active. It's not only seeing them, it's actually taking action to promote their full participation as full members in social interaction and giving them a voice in community dis discussions and decision making. So analyzing our data, we believe that fostering recognition goes hand in hand with promoting representation. And the way that we measured recognition and representation is looking at lecturer engagement with the students and then also well and, and student engagement with the lecturer vice versa and some and peer-to-peer -peer engagement on the next slide we speak a little bit about lecturer engagement 47 percent of the students said it's easier to engage with a lecturer on telegram than in face-to-face -face class and 23 percent of the students said it's easier to engage with the with a lecturer on WhatsApp than in face-to-face. -face. So students ultimately said that they're more comfortable, they feel more recognized, and therefore they feel representative. Significantly, um, when it comes to webinars, we once again see the same as with redistribution. 57% of our students um, said that they prefer using uh, Telegram um, to engage with the lecturer than in webinars. And 43% said they prefer in, uh, using WhatsApp to engage with the lecturer than, than in webinars. And so here, obviously, something that rings true to everyone that has online classes, we, we all know about the ghosts in the classroom. So there, there is a proportion of these students that simply will not participate, um, whether it is webinars um, or, or even in Telegram. But in, in this regard, this supports the fact that the ghosts in the webinars, uh, some of them are, are, will, are inclined to participate, whereas they won't participate in, 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 in a webinar, but they will participate if they're using um, MIMS. Then in one terms minute, of peer one, minute, one minute warning. Okay. In terms of peer-to-peer -peer engagement, 40, uh, 49% and 43% respectively, inter uh, respectively, what, Telegram and WhatsApp said it's easier to engage with the other peers than face-to-face -face, and a whopping 62% and 54% said it's easier for them to engage with each other than in webinars. So from our results, we see that MIMS apps, using MIMS apps such as Telegram and, and WhatsApp, it really promotes social learning and, and social presence. And these findings are significant, especially during lockdown, where acknowledging the student voice becomes critical in the development of sustainable teaching solutions to complete the academic program. 
Um, and then this is just a, a quote that stood out for us. Um, uh, uh, this is a disadvantage, something that we had to think about. One of the students said, honestly, working in WhatsApp um, and trying to do group work on WhatsApp is the most difficult thing ever because there's lots of mis and misunderstandings that tend to happen. And sometimes messages end up being misread and therefore it makes conflicts. Uh, whereas face-to-face, -face, it's easier to express yourself without being misunderstood. And here we realize there's more work. There's yet more work to be done on this. So despite all the benefits of using MIMS apps, that we reported in our previous studies, we need to look at it more and we realize that not only the students, we need to speak to the lecturers as well and get the educator's perspective. So that's something that we actually started doing late this year. And we've had institutional, um, well, on an institutional level. And what has come out of that is that we need institutional guidelines for using MIMS apps. Uh, the final slide, our final thoughts. Um, we, th these are our final thoughts. So we, we feel that we need workshops to develop institutional guidelines as students reported inconsistencies. Ultimately, again, we, we, we'd like to reiterate that it is concluded that uh, the findings of our research is MIMS apps is better suited as a supplementary tool in a classroom environment to support the learner management system, and it should not be used as a primary vehicle of um, curriculum delivery. Flight, flight, my story is eight. Are there any questions? <laughs>